a good opportunity as well. All right, with that, hello again. I am Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service here in Hancock County, uh, joining you by Zoom and by YouTube. Uh, if you're joining my, me by YouTube, do me a favor. Uh, you can subscribe. You'll get updates uh, about when I am uploading new videos. I uh, should get several of those a week. Uh, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and if you put any questions down in the video link, I will see that. Uh, and if you have questions for the video, I'll be happy to come back and either uh, you know, uh, you know, send that answer to you directly uh, or put that answer as a comment there in the YouTube video, which might be interesting for some other people that are seeing that. Uh, now our topic for today is insect pests of ornamentals. Uh, we all have a lot of beautiful plants in our landscape and we want to make sure that we are protecting them uh, from all of those insect pests that are potentially causing problems. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some things about monitoring insect pests, some of the controls and detection methods we can use, uh, and then I'm going to introduce some of the insect pests uh, that we very commonly run into here in Mississippi uh, as well as in our neighboring states uh, and around the southeastern United States. Uh, so getting started, uh, you know, there, there's some things I always like to start talking about uh, when I talk about the, uh, the topic of insects, and, and that is sort of the, the important things that we can do as a, a process of pest management rather than simply thinking about pest management as something that we can apply to the plants and, and control a particular insect, I like to think of it as a, a system that we use to address the, these populations that can cause damage to our, to our plants. Uh, one of the really important steps for that uh, that I also include when I talk about uh, problems with disease, whether we're talking about a vegetable garden uh, or ornamental gardens, is sanitation. Uh, so cleaning up around the bottom of our plants, removing any old plant tissue, uh, getting rid of weeds and things like that really does help uh, limit the pest populations. Uh, a lot of uh, weeds or, or old plant debris can serve as a place for those pest populations to get started. And so if we limit that, we can limit a lot of the problems that we might have. Another really important component of dealing with insect pests uh, is monitoring, which really isn't as official as it has to be. All you really need to do is, is go around your garden on a regular basis, spend some time out there looking for potential problems. If we can catch those populations when they're still quite small, uh, then they are a lot easier to manage when that population gets large and it's just a lot easier to protect than it is to, uh, to go in and, and solve that problem when that pest population has gotten really high. Uh, we also wanna make sure that we have good proper pest identification. Uh, we wanna make sure that we understand the pest that, uh, that's there. Uh, in some cases, we actually wanna look at how uh, how long that uh, insect might still have in its immature stage, uh, because that's really going to inform what we're going to need to do to control that pest, or really if there's an, a need to control it at all. Uh, you know, after that, we're gonna apply a control that's recommended for that particular problem, limit some of the uh, sort of off-target effects that we might have uh, for a, uh, uh, a pest, we don't want to damage pollinators, we don't want to damage any other insects, uh, we just want to target that pest and make sure we're managing it effectively. And it's a really good idea, I've, I've talked about this on a number of occasions, keep a record of what you do, and, and that way we can kind of keep an idea of what problems might turn up on a regular basis, uh, what we did to fix that, how well that worked, um, and that can be really helpful. And then the last stage after we've applied a control uh, is going to be going back and, and continuing to look out for potential problems. 
Uh, so when we're scouting for insects, and I know I've, I've spent some time on this previously, you know, we do want to uh, go out there and, and look at those crops and see if we start to see any of the potential problems. And a lot of the way that I have this phrased here in the slide uh, is really phrased for a commercial grower or for a nursery grower. Uh, but that's something that we can apply to our home landscape as well. So, you know, if we have a plant that's, you know, going to be there for a long, long time, uh, you know, we, we may not need to look at it as often as something that, that has a really quick turnaround, like some of our smaller flowers. Um, but what we're looking for is, is really critical here. What we're looking for is something abnormal about the growth of the plant. Are we seeing yellow leaves or a, a stippled appearance or little white specks on the leaves? Are we seeing signs of direct feeding like we would expect for a caterpillar or a grasshopper where sections of the leaf are, are, are missing? Because that's really going to help us understand what's going on. Uh, one thing that we commonly deal with when we're talking about insects is some of them are quite small. Uh, some of the insects that I'm going to talk about today are a sixteenth of an inch long. Uh, one of the, the mites that I'm talking about is really one fiftieth of an inch. Um, so it can be very difficult to see them just kind of sitting on the plant. It's not something we're going to see from a long way away. Uh, so one thing we can use for that uh, is just using a white sheet of paper, or I frequently use an index card. Uh, or construction paper because it's a little stiffer and easier to work with. Uh, and you can tap that over the, tap the plant over it. And that makes seeing some of these insects in that really nice white background a lot easier uh, and gives us an idea of what might be going on. Uh, generally speaking, we, we wanna look at areas that are gonna border where that pest may come into the environment. So looking at areas that uh, might be up against the, the wood line or up against a ditch or something like that, uh, where we might not be taking care of weeds and things like that, is going to be a place you want to check first because that's somewhere we, where we might have that pest come into the environment uh, and then continue to spread through the area. Uh, one tool that I really like to use uh, in helping monitor for pests are sticky cards. Uh, you can see these in a variety of colors. Probably the most common one is yellow. Uh, these uh, can generally be bought at a lot of garden stores, uh, and they are very effective as a way to monitor uh, for insect pests like white flies or thrips or even fungus gnats and leaf miners. Um, what that allows us to do is, you know, as that insect flies into our environment, uh, they're attracted to that card, they get stuck on it, and rather than having to go and, and peek around through the plant, we can just check that card and it lets us know that we're starting to see that pest show up in our landscape. Uh, occasionally you will see these sticky cards monitor or, or uh, advertised as a way to control insect populations. And they, they really are not effective for that. Uh, not enough of those insect pests are gonna be drawn to that card uh, to, to actually reduce the population down past where you might need to apply a control. What they do is let us know that the pest is showing up. And if we see that population on that sticky card increasing, if we catch 20 white flies this week, in comparison to the one or two that we caught, uh, caught last week, we really have a good idea that that population is increasing. So it lets us know the change in that population over time. Uh, not a silver bullet, uh, but certainly a, an easy way to monitor for pests showing up in the environment. Uh, and particularly those, those kind of small insect pests uh, that might be difficult to see uh, when we're trying to monitor them directly on the plant. Um, there are some, some cultural controls that we can use, some ways that we can grow the plants. And again, the images here are uh, really kind of directed at commercial growers, but, but perfectly applicable uh, to the home landscape. 
Uh, there are resistant population or resistant plants uh, to some insect pests. And if you know you have a history of that problem, uh, growing those resistant varieties can be beneficial. Uh, of course, that's generally going to be for our annuals, uh, things like that, because uh, our, our perennials tend to be around for a good long time. Um, make sure when we bring plants into the landscape that we check them out uh, and make sure that we're not bringing any small insects with us. That's a big way uh, that we wind up bringing a pest in. Um, I see this a lot in vegetables. Uh, you see plants being sold outside of, outside a store, uh, not gonna pick on any particular uh, retailer, um, but occasionally you will see ins insects like aphids or whiteflies on those plants, then people take them home and they spread them to the uh, to the other plants that are in their landscape. So really carefully look over plants before you bring them home, just to make sure that we're not gonna have a problem just bringing that insect into a new environment. Um, if you do have a plant that you know has been infested, uh, if it's in a container or something like that, you can isolate it away from other plants, apply that control, make sure the problem is solved before you introduce it back into your landscape. Um, there are some instances, uh, particularly with things like spider mites and broad mites, uh, where just, you know, if that, that small plant is, is something that we can remove uh, to get rid of that problem, uh, that is something that we can do. And we do generally want to just maintain good plant health. So, we wanna make sure that we've got good fertilization and good water. Um, that's just going to help our plants tolerate any, inner, any injury that they have uh, from insects that come in and start to do damage to them. Uh, another cultural thing we can do, uh, and uh, use this example for scale, uh, if you have a, a plant that's afflicted with that, being able to remove the tissue or the, the area of the plant uh, that's infested, uh, can uh, remove a lot of the problem, uh, and can also make it a lot easier to make sure that you're getting good spray coverage of the plant uh, to make sure that we are getting effective control. Uh, particularly, again, with some of the small insects, it's difficult to know uh, that you've effectively controlled them. Um, so making sure you get spray really good thorough spray coverage of the plant is going to be very important. Uh, and insecticides are an, are, are an essential uh, part of management for, uh, for insect pests on ornamentals, just as they are in other types of plants. Uh, very often we're using foliar sprays uh, for insects or mites. Uh, and in those cases, again, you really do need really thorough coverage of the plant. There's an image there of neem oil, which is very commonly used for a range of different small soft-bodied insect pests. Uh, but we also have systemic insecticides, and these tend to be uh, applied either foliar or, or applied as a drench to the base of the plant, uh, and actually will travel through the plant uh, in order to deliver that, uh, that insecticide. So that's not something that we see in vegetable or fruit production very much. Uh, it's something that we do use uh, extensively for ornamental plants, uh, and it's really a, a very good tool for controlling insects when we have uh, them sucking plant sap as a way of feeding, um, because it's an effective way to deliver that insecticide to them. Well, whenever we're using an insecticide, uh, no matter what, we want to make sure that we pay attention to the label instructions. Um, make sure that we're applying it for a pest that it's effective against, uh, on a tree that we can use it for, uh, and uh, make sure we're applying the amount that is uh, allowed in the way that we're allowed to do that. Uh, and that's for safety as well as just to make sure that we're getting effective use of the chemical that we're applying. Uh, one of the questions that I very frequently get and, uh, and do just want to uh, make a quick comment about uh, very often people are interested in uh, making sure uh, that what they're applying is safe for pollinators. Uh, often you will see a, a little note on the, uh, 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 the, the label for the insecticide 
uh, you know, be safe or pollinator safe, things like that. Uh, but still very important that we follow those, uh, those label directions uh, to make sure that, again, we're targeting the insect pests that we want to control and not getting off target activity of that insecticide. Uh, one of the things that I think is really beneficial uh, and also think gets overlooked quite a lot uh, is the application of dormant oil sprays. Uh, and this is uh, just a, applying a, an oil, uh, generally uh, at, at the very beginning of the year, late winter, uh, generally when temperatures are going to be over 50 degrees. Um, and what we're doing is we're targeting those insect populations uh, and disease problems really early in the year when those populations are just starting to come out of winter uh, when we can knock them down hard, and that way we prevent a lot of the problems that we might see later in the year. Uh, we have the advantage there, again, those populations are small, so the impact that we have in controlling them is much higher. We also avoid a significant amount of damage uh, that we could potentially be doing to beneficial insects. So a uh, really good thing that we can do there. So if you have a tree or a shrub that you know has an infestation or had an infestation last uh, season, uh, particularly for things like scale or for aphids, uh, it's a really good practice to use a dormant oil. Uh, these are usually gonna be horticultural oils like neem oil. Um, there are a variety of other horticultural oils as well. Uh, and it's important we understand these are contact insecticides so we really need to make sure we get thorough coverage of the entire tree uh, or shrub when we're applying these dormant oil sprays, uh, but really effective as a way to just manage uh, insect and disease problems throughout the year. And I kind of put this on the same scale uh, as the use of pre-emergent herbicides, uh, where we're just solving the problem before we would even ever see the problem by using this technique. Uh, really, really uh, uh, advocate for that. Uh, so now I want to start talking about some of the different insects uh, that we are very likely to run into uh, on our orna ornamental plants. Uh, aphids are a, a frequent problem on a wide range of different plants. Uh, crepe myrtles have aphids. Uh, almost all of our uh, uh, different flowers have, have aphids that get on them. Uh, and generally speaking, when aphids uh, first show up, uh, they're very well hidden. Uh, they like to get on new growth that's very lush and soft, uh, and particularly on the underside of leaves. Uh, and they uh, insert a needle-like mouth part into the plant and draw sap out. And, and then they, they just sort of excrete some of that as what we call honeydew, uh, which will often give the plant uh, kind of a sticky feel and a wet appearance. And aphid populations uh, can grow very, very quickly. Um, they can actually reproduce without mating. The females don't need a male uh, for several generations. Uh, so those populations can explode very, very quickly. Uh, sometimes we will see the sort of white uh, cast off exoskeletons on the leaf. Uh, we can confuse those for live insects. Uh, you can see a blown up picture of an aphid here. If you look at it under a magnifying glass, uh, you'll see those two prongs coming off the back end of it, uh, which is a really characteristic kind of way to identify an aphid. Uh, if we have large number of aphids, you will see distorted leaves. Uh, the plant just won't be thriving. Uh, there are some plant viruses, a, a large number of plant viruses that get transmitted by aphids. Uh, and fortunately, individually, they're relatively easy to control. Uh, generally speaking, for, uh, for homeowners, my, my regular way to uh, encourage them to try to control aphids would be by the use of horticultural oil uh, or insecticidal soap. Uh, just make sure that you get their coverage. Uh, you can use uh, different foliar sprays. Uh, things like acephate or imidacloprid plus cyflutherin are, are all labeled for use uh, to control aphids. Um, just, you know, when we start getting into that, we start seeing some, some knock-on effects 
uh, with, uh, with pollinators, and we want to avoid that if we can get effective control uh, just by using a, hort a, a horticulture oil. Um, so um, there are, you know, those soil applied systemic treatments, things like imidacloprid, uh, where we're getting that insecticide to travel through the plant, uh, really good for plants that where, where we just know we're going to have a, a big outbreak or we're very likely to. Uh, kind of similar in how they live, whiteflies, um, there are two species that we commonly see here in, uh, in the south or uh, really all over. Uh, for most people's uh, use, the, there's not a lot of difference uh, in the behavior of the two insects. Uh, they all, all have white powdery wings and they are relatively easy to detect on the plant. Uh, if you tap the plant, you'll generally see the white flies kind of flying around. Um, and uh, the immatures are really hard to see. Uh, they're kind of little uh, oval blobs that are really close up, uh, hold up to the plant. They don't move around. Um, and they tend to be just like aphids on the underside of leaves, uh, sucking out on that plant sap. Um, cause much the same problem. They, they release that same sugary, sticky stuff uh, that causes the development of sooty mold or a black fungus that grows over the surface of the leaf. Um, they can, again, for homeowners, be controlled uh, with, uh, with horticultural oils. Uh, it does take a little bit of patience because if you're using something like a horticultural oil, what you're probably getting is effective control of the immatures, uh, but because the adults are so mobile, they, they fly around, uh, and so we do need to kind of stick with it and apply that uh, insecticide several times uh, in order to make sure that we're getting an effective management. So uh, if you apply it several times, several days apart, five days apart, uh, you make sure that you're killing those immatures and you kind of cut off their life cycle, uh, but you're still going to see some adults flying around uh, until they kind of age out. Uh, of course, uh, the same soil applied systemic insecticides like imidacloprid, uh, dinotefuran is a really effective one. Uh, also called green light tree and shrub uh, insecticide or safari uh, are really effective uh, for uh, white flies and, and for some other insects we're going to talk about. Um, and in a lot of cases, we do need uh, resistant plants for white flies. Uh, they can be a pretty serious issue. Um, mealy bugs uh, get called mealy bugs because they have all that powdery material over their body. Uh, they kind of look cottony. Uh, you can see that bottom uh, picture where you have all that kind of white waxy material. Uh, the females uh, uh, just kind of look uh, like those oval wingless things you see up there in the top. Nymphs or the immatures look very much the same. Uh, and generally, again, we see these on the underside of leaves. Um, and the symptoms wind up being the same. You see that the honeydew, the sudy mold, uh, distortion of the leaves, and uh, uh, generally small infestations. We can control those by horticultural oil. Uh, in some cases, you, you can just manage a small infestation by hand picking the insects off um, because they tend to be pretty easy to see. Uh, but those same soil treatments with imidacloprid um, can, uh, can be effective. Uh, if you have a really heavy infestation, uh, you can use both of those to make sure that you get really effective control. If you have the opportunity to isolate those plants, uh, you can do that. And mealybugs are insects we very frequently see on house plants. Uh, so I do see them outside, uh, but usually when somebody uh, calls me or sends me an image and it, it turns out to be mealybugs, it, it's something that I see very frequently on house plants. Uh, scale insects. Um, Two different main kinds of the, of the scale insects. If we break it down into two categories, there's the soft scale uh, and then the armored scale. Uh, and soft scale tends to be larger, produces a lot of honeydew, so you get that sooty mold condition. Uh, armored scale, we don't see a lot of honeydew production, so we don't tend to, be that ha uh, tend to have that problem. Um, they bo both behave very much the same. They kind of have that you know, hard covering over them they sit in one place and suck out the sap of the plant. Uh, really important to try to avoid introducing these into your landscape. 
um, check over those new plants, make sure you don't see any of these scales. Uh, with the soft scale, they tend to be larger. You tend to see them more on the stems of the plant more often. Uh, they just look like kind of hard lumps that you can pop off. Uh, armored scale, uh, much more flat to the leaf. Uh, generally find them on the underside of leaves. Uh, and oftentimes you'll see something like this uh, where there's just an awful lot of them uh, on, the, uh, on the leaves. Uh, you can kind of scrape them off to uh, to see what you're dealing with. Uh, so really important, don't buy or, or bring in any infested plants. Uh, if you do have a plant that's not in the ground and you want to manage it, sometimes it's just easier to get rid of the plant uh, than try to get rid of this problem. Uh, but you can use both, you can use horticultural oil against scale problems. Uh, what you're getting on that is effective. Again, and you're, you're killing the immatures. Uh, there's a stage where they're crawling around and active before they kind of hunker down and start feeding from one place only. Uh, and again, you're killing those immatures. So uh, what you will find as you're, you're applying an insecticide is the scales are, are kind of glued to the plant. Uh, so even after you've applied that insecticide, they don't necessarily fall off. Uh, so you may continue to see them. And what you will look for uh, is scale on the new growth uh, to see if you've got an effective management of that problem. Uh, and those same systemic soil treatments, imidacloprid are great for, uh, is great for soft scale. Uh, Dinotafuran, again, green light tree and shrub insect control. Uh, is really effective for both soft and armored scale. Uh, I'm a big fan of just buying one pesticide if I can get away with it. Uh, if I know that product is going to work on either pro uh, problem, that tends to be the one uh, that I'm going to want to buy. Uh, getting a little bit uh, off from those, uh, thrips uh, are again a really small insect, uh, about 1 16th of an inch long, uh, tend to feed in flowers. Uh, fit, uh, on, on, on new growth and underside of leaves, get that same leaf curl where the leaves kind of curl downwards. Um, can use a, a foliar spray to control this, but again, you know, insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils, uh, where you get good spray coverage is going to be an effective way to manage these. Uh, and this is really an insect where sampling, uh, either using a sticky card or sampling using a, a white a uh, white piece of card to tap the plant onto uh, is going to be a good tool to uh, to make sure uh, that you're uh, you're detecting this problem when it starts to show up. Uh, spider mites, the smallest thing we're going to talk about today, spider mites are about a 50th of an inch long, uh, really quite small. The picture that you see there is, is much blown up. Uh, what you're far more likely to see on a plant in your landscape is in that bottom image. Uh, where you actually see some webbing on the plant, uh, and the sp spider mites make those web you make those webs as a way to protect their immatures, uh, protect their eggs, uh, and generally we'll often see kind of a stippling appearance, uh, or a yellowing or, or bronzed appearance on the leaves uh, that tells us uh, that we have a spider mite infestation. And we see those sort of symptoms of the insect rather than seeing the in this case, really an arachnid, not, a, not an insect. Um, so again, horticultural oils tend to be a, a big, pro, uh, you know, for homeowners tend to be the best way to manage this. Uh, we tend to see them, you know, more when there are high temperatures and dry conditions. Uh, sometimes we'll see these after we've applied an insecticide for some other problem because the insecticide we use uh, kills off some predatory mites that would keep their population down. Uh, so using those horticultural uh, oil sprays uh, tends to be pretty effective at knocking them down uh, rather than getting into some of those things that uh, tend to be uh, you know, more used in the, in the commercial industry. Uh, very frequent problem, again, particularly in house plants. Uh, but we see it in other areas of the garden as well, are fungus gnats. Um, they're a kind of fly. The larvae live down in the soil. And a lot of times what they're really doing is feeding on decaying organic matter. Uh, but they will also prune roots. Uh, they'll, they'll feed on those root hairs. 
uh, which can impact the growth of plants. I see this on seedlings very frequently when I'm when I'm trying to produce seedlings to put out in the landscape. Uh, and uh, more importantly to me, they can actually spread some fungal pathogens by their feeding. They pick it up in the soil and as they're feeding, they deliver that right to the root uh, and give that, that fungus a way to get to the roots. Um, fungus gnats really thrive in wet soil media. Uh, they really, really like excessively moist conditions. Uh, so maintaining a good proper watering is really important. Let that soil dry out a little bit uh, and that tends to help solve some of those fungus gnat problems. Uh, and there are some uh, soil drench treatments you can use. The best ones in my mind are the, the BT-based ones, that's Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, really effective at controlling the larvae. Uh, it's a slightly different BT uh, than the BT we use to control caterpillars. Uh, you can see there are some other uh, products that are used in commercial industry uh, to try to get rid of fungus gnats because they are a, a serious problem, particularly for plant propagation. Uh, if you have any cannas, you've probably seen the canna leaf roller. Uh, this is a caterpillar. Uh, and uh, you, uh, when you uh, first get that uh, caterpillar, it tends to be kind of large and clear, uh, kind of clearish white. Uh, see that picture there on the right. Uh, tend to be a, kind of a pale green as they move on. Uh, and they actually spin a li little bit of silk thread and that allows them to roll up that leaf in order to protect themselves from anything that might want to try to eat them. Um, but they feed on the leaf blades, kind of makes them kind of noshed and ragged. Uh, oftentimes, you know, they, if it's before the uh, leaf really unrolls, uh, you'll see little dots uh, or holes kind of in a line across the leaf from where they fed. Uh, really easy to control uh, with BT insecticides. Uh, you can see seven, uh, you can see where I say carbaryl there. Uh, that should, uh, it's no longer carbaryl, but the, the new formulation is effective as well. Uh, and spinosad would be another insecticide that's very effective for use against canna leaf roller. Uh, if you have azaleas, you've probably run into the azalea lace bug. Um, the picture of the lace bugs down there on the bottom have kind of lacy wings. They're about an eighth of an inch long. Uh, <coughs> and in practice for me, <coughs> excuse me, um, I, I see the damage that they do long before I actually see the insects themselves. So uh, as they feed, um, you can see that stippled appearance, those white specks that, that kind of all run together on the images there. Um, but if you turn over those leaves, you're going to see black specks on the underside of the leaf. Uh, that black speck is the, the fecal matter of the insect that kind of glues to the leaf. Uh, and that is a certain sign that you have one of these lace, lace bugs there. I uh, tend to see these showing up in early spring. They're an early problem in the year. Uh, and you can use something like permethrin or permethrin or, or pyrethrin uh, as an effective uh, tool to manage these in most cases. Uh, malathion isn't a product that I enjoy using because it tends to smell very bad. Um, and of course you can use those, that, those same systemic insecticides for managing as well. Uh, but generally, in my experience, the permethrin type or pyrethroid insecticides uh, are, are really effective for managing this problem. Uh, the other problem we run into on azaleas is the azalea caterpillar. Uh, they have a, a very distinct appearance as a caterpillar, black bodies with white stripes on them, uh, really reddish head and reddish rear end. Um, feed by defoliation, they, they're chewing on the leaves. Um, I, I get azalea caterpillars every year on my azaleas um, and they can, uh, they can be pretty serious defoliators. In my experience, they're, they're feeding right about when I wanna cut the leaves off my azalea, my, you know, cut back my azaleas anyway. Uh, so I don't tend to do a whole lot for these. Uh, 
but they can be pretty serious defoliators, so you do want to keep an eye out for them. Uh, uh, you can control these. If you catch them early, uh, when the insects are still small, I would say, you know, quarter of an inch or so, uh, you can control those with BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, if not, I would either use, use 7, which again is a new formulation, not carbaryl, uh, or use spinosad as an effective tool to, uh, to manage this caterpillar. Uh, tend to see these late in the summer. Uh, I tend to run into them more in August. Uh, so, so they have already uh, done what they are going to do in my landscape at this part, uh, at this point in the year. Uh, and you, you do occasionally see azalea caterpillars. Uh, there's a question in the chat box uh, or a comment in the uh, uh, about them showing up on blueberries. Uh, it turns out azalea and blueberry are pretty closely related as plants go. Um, so uh, the azalea caterpillars will get on blueberries. Um, and uh, the, the comment there is that they were told to uh, just kind of let them be. Um, they, they may have been told that by me uh, because again, that, that can often be my response to things is, you know, they're about to age out anyway. They've done what they're gonna do. Um, but again, if you're, if you're having problem, if your plant's getting severely defoliated, uh, the use of those insecticides is a, uh, a way we can address that problem. Uh, another, another caterpillar pest that uh, doesn't really look like a caterpillar pest, this is bagworms. Uh, we tend to see these on conifers very often, things like cedar or juniper, uh, arbor vitae. Uh, and they actually make that bag out of the webbing and out of the, the bits of the uh, plant that they're feeding on. Uh, and the caterpillar lives inside of that little bag, uh, again, kind of as a way to protect it from things that might try to eat it. Um, they, they do this fascinating thing where the young caterpillars actually send out a strand of silk, uh, and that allows them to move on to new plants before they make it make that bag. Um, the easiest way to manage these, in my experience, if you just have a relatively small number of them, what I do is I get a switch and I just go along knocking them off the plant, uh, and that does a, a really good job of getting rid of them. If you have some young people around, uh, you can get those young people to uh, get out there and collect all of them, uh, and that's a great way to do that. Um, you can use either BT or Spinosad to control them. Uh, most of the most of the damage I see being caused by bagworms is just seeing the bagworm itself. Um, very very uncommon for me to see enough enough problems uh, with bagworms to uh, to really merit a, a lot of energy in controlling them. Uh, so generally, like I say, I think hand removal is a great way to approach this. Uh, we actually do have a bagworm that we'll occasionally see inside our houses as well. Uh, sometimes you'll see them on the walls. Uh, I never uh, encountered them until I came down to South Mississippi. Uh, but again, hand removal is perfectly fine rather than uh, getting into using an insecticide for that. Uh, so I want to spend uh, just a few minutes now talking about a uh, pretty serious issue, uh, and that is crepe myrtle bark scale. Uh, and uh, here in Hancock County and along our other coastal counties, uh, we do have this invasive insect that has now shown up. Uh, it was recently detected as in within the past week in Pearl River County uh, and is a potentially serious pest uh, for crepe myrtle and a few other plants that we have in our landscape. Uh, it's really a, a big concern. You know, previous to now, crepe myrtle has, uh, has been kind of bulletproof in terms of not having any real serious problems that we needed to worry about. Um, but this is definitely one we want to keep our eye out for. Uh, you see the scientific name there, uh, and, and it is an invasive insect species that started out in Asia. Uh, and the picture on this slide here shows you kind of a close-up of what you would see if you looked very closely at a uh, infested plant. Uh, and then that image there, uh, uh, the the other image of the of the crepe myrtle. 
uh, is actually the, the image of the first detection uh, of crepe myrtle bark scale uh, here in Hancock County. Uh, though I have seen quite a few uh, pictures of crepe myrtle bark scale uh, in other areas. Uh, so uh, in, for crepe myrtle bark scale, the, the female produces that kind of white felt like sack around their bodies. So what you see are those kind of white um, you know, covered insects. Um, the uh, female lays uh, anywhere from 100 to 300 eggs. Uh, those uh, hatch out into pink crawlers uh, that crawl all around the plant, find new places to set up shop. Uh, and very often the way that we identify new, in, new infestations of crepe myrtle bark scale is because these, these populations build up very high uh, and we get a lot of that sooty mold on the plant. So the plant may be turned almost entirely black uh, by the sooty mold. You may even see it down on the ground beneath the plant. Uh, if you want to make a really easy positive identification of crepe myrtle bark scale, uh, if you crush or stick a pin in one of those little white insects that you see, uh, they have kind of a pinkish uh, hemolymph for insect blood. Uh, and so you'll see that pink color, uh, which is really a uh, kind of a, an easy way to identify this problem. Uh, but you'll see them on twigs, branches, the trunk, uh, you see them all over the plant. Uh, and it's really important if you're buying a new crepe myrtle plant, really investigate it very closely to make sure you're not introducing this into your area. Uh, as with scale insects or anything else, you know, we're moving them a lot faster uh, than the scale could move itself uh, or get moved on wildlife and things like that. Uh, so making sure you're not introducing it into your landscape is going to be really important. Um, and, you know, in terms of control, it's something that you're going to have to stick with in order to make sure that you have an effective control strategy for dealing with this problem. It might take several years to get effective control. Uh, if you have a really inf heavily infested plant, unless you're just in love with that plant, uh, sometimes the, the best thing to do is to remove it and replace it. So, um, you know, in, in a case where you have a small plant, you just put something in and you detect that problem, just removing that plant and getting rid of it and, and removing it from your landscape is something that can work very effectively. Um, you're going to need to use foliar insecticide sprays uh, repeatedly uh, to kind of uh, control the immatures as they come out. Uh, and I really recommend a dormant oil spray uh, because you can try to hit that population just as they're coming out of the, the cold part of the year uh, and knock them down before they uh, get to a, be a big problem. Uh, you are going to wind up using some soil applied systemic insecticides um, in both imidacloprid and dinotefuran that I've previously mentioned. Um, so uh, bio-advanced tree and shrub insect control or uh, green light tree and shrub spray. Uh, both are going to be really effective treatments. And, and this is one of those instances uh, where it might be a really good idea to call in some help. So, um, you know, if you start to see this problem or if you think you have this problem, the first thing that I would want you to do uh, is to contact your county extension agent. So uh, we want to make sure that we're kind of keeping track of where we're seeing this problem uh, here in the uh, state. Uh, so, you know, if you think you have crepe myrtle bark scale, uh, give me or one of my counterparts a call. Uh, we'd be happy to come out and check and see what's going on and make sure that we have a proper identification. Uh, but the next thing that you might want to do is to call a professional landscape uh, management person. Uh, they're, they're probably going to have the, the pesticide applicator's license uh, to really aggressively manage this problem. Uh, and not only on the crepe myrtle where you have, where you see the problem, but on all of the crepe myrtles in your environment uh, to make sure that we really effectively get rid of that. Uh, and then we're going to make sure that we do follow-up treatments in the following year. And again, possibly beyond that uh, to make sure that we are effectively controlling it and preventing it from spreading. Uh, 
So there are some foliar applications. Again, generally we're gonna want a commercial applicator for that. Uh, they do have some, some gross regulators that require those uh, commercial applicators license uh, in order to effectively use. Uh, the, uh, uh, just to answer a question, how do, I, how do you tell apart a, a mealy bug from a, a, a crepe merle bark scale? The easiest test, again, if you stick it with a pen or crush it, if you see that pink coloration, uh, that is a really good indication of the, uh, uh, that what you have is crepe myrtle bark scale. Uh, mealy bugs, that covering is kind of waxy, so you can kind of brush it away, uh, and you'll see the insect underneath that. Uh, with these scale insects, you can't do that. You're, uh, you'll just kind of pop the insect off of the branch. So if you can brush away that coverage and you see a little a little soft-bodied insect, that's a mealy bug. If you poke it with a with a needle or something like that, and some pink comes out, uh, you definitely have crepe myrtle bark scale. And again, please give your county extension office a call. Uh, foliar sprays. Again, most of those are going to be by our uh, commercial applicators. Uh, going to be used in conjunction with the soil applied drench treatment. Uh, they do have some insect growth regulators that kind of help prevent some problems. Uh, but uh, you're, you're going to, again, you're going to use those in combination. Uh, so products like acephate and bifenthrin and then those uh, insect growth regulators that are kind of limited to, to commercial applicators. All right, so those are my comments for today. Uh, I don't want to scare you about crepe myrtle bark scale. That's by no, uh, you know, by no means my uh, intention. Uh, but crepe myrtles are a, a really important part of our landscapes down here uh, throughout the southeastern United States. Uh, so definitely something to keep in, you know, keep an eye out for uh, in your landscape, to keep an eye out for as you're purchasing plants to introduce into your landscape. Uh, and uh, again, one of those problems where if we can detect it early uh, in the landscape, it's going to be a lot easier to manage. Uh, then if we let, allow that population to build, uh, so it'll be a lot easier and cheaper for you uh, and for your neighbors potentially uh, if we can, uh, can manage that problem early. Uh, so with that, I am going to close off again. Uh, I appreciate listening. If you're on YouTube and you've made it to the end, thank you very much. Uh, please, if you have any questions, you can put those in the comment area down at the bottom. Uh, and I will answer them as soon as I get the opportunity uh, here uh, in the uh, live webinar. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Uh, 